So thanks, thanks, Fira. I'm happy to be here. Um, because we're a small enough group of people, I suggest that if there are questions as we're going along, um, the people on the phone, the people in the room, if there's anything, just feel free to um, interrupt and ask questions. We can have a much more interactive discussion than a frontal lecture, which I always prefer. And what I want to do a bit today is to divide our talk into two halves. One, begin with an overview of Israeli philanthropy, give you a bit of a sense of what's going on today in Israel in the very growing and developing philanthropic scene in Israel. And the second half focus more in some practical advice about grant making in Israel, especially to funders who are based outside of Israel but are involved with what's going on there. But we can really take it to additional directions and emphasis according to what you are interested as I go along, okay? So everyone can follow the, can we minimize the right side so we can see yes. how do you do that? This? Just like that, um, the okay. one on the left. Okay. Yes. Okay, so when we talk about philanthropy in Israel, we often begin from the very traditional notion of Jews living outside of Israel, supporting Israel, um, the Tzedakah box from Keren Kayemet Israel, which is a, 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 a very typical image to the reflection of what philanthropy used to look like then. You go around Jewish communities around the world, you fundraise for the Jews in Israel who are building Palestine. So as you can see here, help him build Palestine, help them build the Jewish future. So it's very much the collective responsibility of the Jewish people to invest in Israel and develop the country. A lot of the investment, the philanthropic investment was in infrastructure. And when you look at Israel today, all the basic entities in Israel, universities, hospitals, art institutes, cities, nuclear reactor, army, all of that is based to a very large extent on philanthropic funding that came from outside of Israel, supporting Israel. And, and it's a very young country. So when you look at what happened in 70 years, the big boost of this and catalyzing a lot of this was the ability to bring funds from outside and help these processes happen a lot faster. But the character of philanthropy was very much oriented into infrastructure, buildings, um, and issues like that. And grant making or philanthropy was often very emotional, very personal, and very random. And all three, of course, are connected to each other. Someone had a personal story or a family connection or a neighbor or something that connected them to an issue or a locality or a specific population, which created the focus of their giving. Um, but it was in no means what we call today strategic philanthropy because of these elements. Um, and also the we know best mentality of Israelis that are in Israel. And for many years, the, at least the way we, we look at it now is that they wanted people to give them money, but not to tell them what to do. We know best what we need in Israel. You just look, give us the money and let us do what we know best to do. And that, of course, is a discourse that has changed or is changing, but to a large extent has is, is changed already. If we zoom into the past 15 to 20 years, we see a big change in what we call the Israeli philanthropy. To a large extent, the miracle, so to, speak, so to call it, happened. The country exists. We have a country. You know, we can talk a lot about how well it's operating, but that's not what the talk is about today. But we have a country. We don't need to build the basic infrastructure of it right now. It's there. It's operating. It's, it's working. It has a population. It's innovative. It has businesses. It has a flourishing economy and so on. Israel is maturing from a social mindset and a big shift in the past 20 years from a more socialist center. Socialist. Conscious, socialist. socialist. Yeah. Um, out to a more privatized, more um, um, capitalistic in, in many ways, which of course led to growing wealth, but also to growing social gaps inside Israeli society. And we see a big, and a lot of philanthropy is channeled into these issues today, large needs that are growing because of this um, growing wealth and growth of social gaps. We had many waves of Aliyah, of immigration to Israel from numerous places around the world, which created a lot of challenges within um, the social fabric of Israel. And what we called for many years, it was a scene of philanthropists, but not a philanthropy. So it's, I can't say that we didn't have philanthropy in Israel. Even in the early years, there were always a few big families that funded 
Israeli families that funded Israel. But a lot of it, first of all, was that old type or traditional philanthropy as we characterized a minute ago, but also was very few and they didn't even define themselves as philanthropists. It was just people who gave money because they could. In the growing years, and especially in the past 10, 15 years, we see the shift from a scene of philanthropists, which are individuals and families, and sometimes in rare occasions, foundations, because we don't have a legal entity in Israel of a philanthropic foundation that are forming, and I think to a large extent with JFN efforts or JFN Israel's efforts, forming into a community of funders and into a scene of philanthropists, a philanthropy rather than a philanthropist. So what do I mean by this? It's not only individual funders that give, but a lot of them network with each other, share ideas, collaborate, strategize more, and we'll go into those characteristics in a minute. The proportion of wealth is also very different who was rich 30 years ago is never compared to So who's rich now? Never. Right, we'll get to some of that data in a minute. You're very right. So let's try to talk a bit of numbers. What do you think this number is? 35,000, what does that stand for? Any thoughts? The number of people who gave at least $1,000 last, the equivalent of 1,000 shekel in Israel last year? Mm, interesting, but no. Any other ideas? It's not per capita income. The population of part is Hana. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. Okay, so 35,000 is the number of nonprofits in Israel. Amutot. And if you divide it per capita, we're talking roughly one per 200, which is a ratio that is almost inconceivable when you think about it and compare it anywhere else in the world. Now, it's a bit of a, of a twisted picture because many of these amutot, of these nonprofits, it's really easy to start one. You list one down, it might not be active afterwards. It might be a small synagogue that just needs to raise funds or a small community, a group of people. It doesn't, you know, it can be in the same, under the same uh, uh, definition of a, of a nonprofit, but you'd have a huge nonprofit with a $10 million annual budget, and then you'll have a small nonprofit with no budget at all. But it's very easy to start one. If you look into those who have what we call the 501c3, the Israel equivalent of that, which is called 46 Aleph, we have about 4,000 or 4,500 nonprofits that actually have that tax extent status, which is a very small portion of the 35,000. But still, it's a big scene of a lot of social activist groups, a lot of citizen groups. And then as active democracy, there are a lot of people that are trying to get involved in doing it. But it also is a big challenge for philanthropists to try to figure out within this very many, how do you choose and how do you identify and how do you oversee? And we'll get to that a bit later. Second figure to play with, 100 billion new Israeli shekels. What is that? Any thoughts? It's money from outside. No. It's the total annual income of the third sector in Israel. So what we call the third sector is the nonprofit sector in Israel. It's a very large figure. When you talk about money, 100 billion new Israeli shekels is the total income that runs into these nonprofits. In a minute, we'll get to where this money comes from, but it's a relatively large figure. And it's important to realize this when you think about philanthropy in Israel, because it puts things into proportion. Third figure to look at, which is related to what we just talked about, the 50, 35, 15. And when we look at that 100 billion, we're talking about roughly 50% of that that comes from the government. So 50% of the nonprofit sector in Israel is funded by the government. And a lot of it, part of the privatization of the government and its responsibilities, it actually operates through many of these nonprofits, especially in social services, and the money comes through the government. 35% is self-generated income, and only 15% of that big figure we just looked at comes from philanthropy. And I'm not dividing overseas and Israel domestic philanthropy, we'll get to that in a second, but just in general. So I think this just, I'm, the fact that I stopped just to notice this is for you to realize the proportion and to have realistic expectations of what philanthropy can expect and have some modesty about the other numbers that are floating out there and are invested in these issues at the same time 
that the philanthropic sector is doing that. Having that said, I'm very convinced that Israel, being such a small country with very close connections between people, you can reach results relatively very fast. And you can make a real impact, impact on a local level, sometimes on a national level. And I think it's a different scale of time to reach uh, achievements when you compare it to other parts of the world. Sometimes philanthropists in Israel are so um, well connected, within two phone calls they reach the right minister, or they have connections you know, with big bus business people, and they can mobilize assets, and they can influence the way things happen in a much, rapid, much more rapid pace. Okay? So if we wanted to talk about the ratio of how much of that money, that 15% that we spoke about, how much of it comes from international Jewish fund funders and how much of it is local money coming from Israeli philanthropists, which one of these would you choose? The 2080, the 1090, 40, 60, or 50, 50? Any guesses? Which side? Which side? Whatever you say. Do you think it's 80 from international funding and 20 domestic Israeli funding, 90 international and 10 domestic, 60 international and 40 domestic, or half? 60, 40. Well done. So when we speak about this ratio, and usually people get this wrong, because I think there's still a preconceived notion that the majority of the philanthropic money invested in Israel is still based overseas, heavily North America, and channeled into Israel. But that's not the case any longer, and it hasn't been for the past few years. Um, and we're almost getting close to 50-50. There's a big survey that's being done now um, with the uh, Central Bureau of Statistics in Israel, with the Center of Law and Philanthropy at the Tel Aviv University, with Committed to Give to have new numbers, much more accurate, exactly on how much is coming from each direction. But the general neighborhood of figures is that we're getting close to being even, so it's not so long, no, it's not no longer that relationship of we give, you receive, it's really we're all giving, and let's figure out how we can do this together in a collaborative model. I gave to it go? to yeah. I'm sorry, to go, I just want to clarify, this is Ellen. Um, it, that number is talking about how much is actually given as opposed to what percentage of gifts are uh, uh, the dollar amount is American versus Israel, uh, foreign versus Israeli. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, is that dealing with, say, the government money that's going to nonprofits as well, or you're dealing strictly no, with philanthropic no, dollars? Just the philanthropic dollars. Okay, thank you. The okay. division of the philanthropic dollars invested in Israel, 40% origins from Israel and 60% origins elsewhere. Okay? Yes, thank you. Okay, so the, yeah, the total income, we know that these figures now, we know that they're not 100% accurate, but again, it's ballpark figures. We're talking about 14 billion shekels, about eight of them from overseas, and six of them are based Israeli. Now, another interesting fact to talk about before we zoom more into is that 65% of Israeli donations are small household donations. Okay, and that's worth stopping for a minute and listening to this fact. Often people say Israelis don't give. Why don't Israelis give? I give this talk often around the world and it's like, why are we the only ones who give? So first of all, the slide before is here to say, we do give, Israelis do give. And more and more, and it's a challenge, it's a work in progress. There are many reasons why Israelis don't give as much as maybe Jews outside of Israel give. Some of them are just that we lack role models for giving. It's not a good social status yet. There's still a lot of criticism. People are usually suspected to have a hidden agenda if they're philanthropists in Israel. Maybe you have a business agenda you want to get across, so that's why you're donating, and then they'll owe you something. There's a lot of suspicion around this field. Um, there's also, um, some people say, we give back to society. We pay taxes, we serve in the army, we do our reserve duty, you know. We don't need to give back. So a lot of these maybe were true for many years. I don't think they hold any longer. And I don't think they are heard that much. And I think there is a growing culture. It's slower, it's challenging, but there is a growing culture of Israelis that give and that are proud of their giving. And it's part of what JFN's Israel's role is to create these opportunities for people to share, to be proud of what they do, to get the skills that they need to do it in the best way that they can, to learn and be inspired and inspire others and so on. So this is an evolution that we're in the middle of and it will still take time, but this is changing. There's also a large element of volunteer 
charitable that's, donation of time. That's true. Uh, probably more so than in this country. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah, it's not right. Yeah, and many other here, you know, the, I've fallen down and I can't get up is Yatsara, yeah. and here it's expensive commercial. Yeah, yeah it's a, yeah, it's it's a, a difference. difference. And that goes back to the social mindset that we have that is still um, the door to door with the text yeah, cash for the, the, on your cell phone, right? Whatever. Yeah, and check to donate. Yeah. So when we look at the figures and we say a lot of the money is originating from Israel, but 65 of it, 65% of it are small household donations. By the way, we're talking about $80 per donation, total for each donation. This isn't large money. So the big problem about this, it accumulates to large figures, but because it's many, 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 many households, it is not strategically channeled. And it doesn't necessarily reach a significant social change in Israel. Because it goes, spreads very thin on random issues, it doesn't have the power of strategic philanthropy. And our challenge is not to work with those small household donations, but to work with that sector in Israeli society that has the ability to give the larger amounts of money and to do it in an effective way, in a strategic way. So what are we talking about? According to Merit to Credit Swiss, um, they did a survey in Israel in 2016. We have 105,000 millionaires in Israel. And in 2016, an additional 17,000 millionaires added into that category. Dollar figures. Dollar figures. U.S. dollars. Counting their homes or not counting? Counting, um, not homes, counting um, at least a million dollars uh, that are free to invest. Okay. We also know that we have within that division of within those 105,000, about 405 have between 50 to 100 million dollars and 259 have between 100 to 500 million dollars. So those are the bigger players that we're talking about. Yeah, Terry Anderson and many, many others. But this is no small figure any longer. Also, there the are also Israeli billionaires. The Forbes was... Here you go. Okay. 18,000 billionaires. And 18,000 billionaires, that's what they count. Um, sorry, maybe, yeah, 18. In dollars? I don't... Maybe, maybe, wait, I need to double check that figure. Now you're, maybe eight, no, maybe eight, sorry, 18, no, I dropped the zero. 18, but one more added in in 2016. Okay, right, it's 18, um, erase the zeros, please. Yeah. 18 billionaires. Um, and then, the, you know, we have big exits every, every year in the past few years in high tech for the, over the past decade. And these are young entrepreneurs that come to wealth in a relatively young age, some of them are not in the mindset yet to give back in philanthropy. A lot of them reinvest, a lot of them go on a serial exit um, mission to reinvest and have another exit, and only when they mature, maybe another decade later, when they're a bit older and they don't think that their finance is gonna disappear, they have more stability and trust in that, that the money is there to stay, and they can look aside at society and think, how do we give back? And we, we're working actually with that generation that had the exit 10, 15 years ago and are now giving back into society. But we're also working with a few young couples that just became very wealthy very recently, are very new to money, and already are deciding to do philanthropy. And it's a very exciting journey to walk these people uh, through the journey of figuring out what it is they want to do. So there are a lot of challenges to working with these numbers. In Israel, we have about 110 members, which is a quarter of the membership, right, Melissa? It's a quarter of the JFN global membership is based in Israel today, which added into JFN in the past eight years. So it's a, it's a high growth level in a short amount of time. We think analyzing these, this information that we have the potential of about 500 families to be members in Israel. Now, there are a lot of obstacles, not all of them want to be members, not all of them are philanthropists, although they could be, but we believe that there is a potential of a five-time growth from where we're at today if we reach everyone. But, so there is still a, a large untouched market that we're just getting started to a large extent. And a lot, again, a lot of it is about developing the want from people to become philanthropists. It's not only that they can, but they actually want to, want to be there. 
So there is a lot of potential. If we just talk a bit about where donations are going to, the three main issues are religion, education, and social services. By the way, it's the same when you analyze American philanthropy. It's just that the order is different. In Israel, number one is social services, number two, education, number three, religion. In the States, religion is number one. I don't know if you know that. Um, and uh, education and uh, social services are number two and number three. But are generally... Are you analyzing Jewish population in America? No, or is it general, general population. Yeah. Like the, the, right, as in the the in right. the church, every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Now the 13% described as philanthropy. So part of that is infrastructure, nonprofits that support the philanthropic sector, just like JFN or a few others that work within this and define themselves when they register as a nonprofit. One of the issues they deal with is philanthropy. That's why they're classified there. But partly it's because we do not have a legal entity of a foundation in Israel. So many of the people who give out money in Israel do it through a nonprofit, but the core of what they do is called philanthropy. So I can, I can be a, a millionaire starting a nonprofit in Israel and I call it a foundation and I give money to X, Y, and Z. But when I classify it, I call it philanthropy, not okay. education. So it's a catch-all as opposed to infrastructure. So it's both. It has both of them in there. And uh, we don't have the, the specific data how it's allocated. Now, unlike in the States where there is full transparency about where the money comes from, where it goes to, people have to report. It's very easy to obtain information in Israel. It's the complete opposite. When you give out money, you don't have to tell anyone. The only people who need to have full disclosure are the nonprofits. They need to show where they get the money from. And often that becomes problematic with politics and financing of, uh, of political campaigns and so on. But they need to show where the money is coming from. And if you analyze that, cutting back, you can figure out where some of the money is coming from. But even if you give a donation to a nonprofit and you want to remain anonymous, you can ask for it. And then when they report, they can leave you as an anonymous line. So it's pretty easy not to know where the money comes from. It's very hard to get a full picture of where all the money is coming from and how much exactly is coming from philanthropy in Israel. And we still have a long way to go there. And of course I didn't, and I'm not stopping so much to, to drill into the issues of tax incentives that are lacking severely in Israel. And may, there may be the biggest incentive that created such a flourishing philanthropic world in the States. Um, it's so problematic the way it operates in Israel, and it's so hard to really get take that advantage is that it doesn't encourage people to give. And, uh, and the second thing, the platform of having an entity like a foundation, these two technical legal aspects of having a problem and setting up philanthropy in Israel are big obstacles in a way. We are trying to figure out how to help. There are discussions with the um, Ministry of Finance and the uh, Ministry of Law, but it's still a long way to come to reach much easier processes to make it easier on people to give money in Israel. So I want to zoom in a bit and to talk about the characteristics of Israeli philanthropists, because I think it's interesting and people aren't always aware that they're different than a lot of the international funders or Jewish funders that are based outside of Israel. So first of all, many of them, the vast majority, I would say, are proactive and entrepreneurial in nature. They identify a problem, they care about it, and they want to solve it. Often, bypassing maybe a phase that they map the field, identify the problems, map the players, decide how to allocate the funding. Sometimes it's business people that are very good business people that are very proactive in their business life. They take the same approach, the same energy, start their own NGO and try to solve the issue. So we see very proactive, but also very entrepreneur, new models, trying to figure out new ideas, collaborations, intersectoral, um, bringing people around the table, really trying to think outside the box. So again, it's the out of the box thinking that characterizes Israelis as a whole. You can also see it reflected through philanthropy. Deep content knowledge. Often when you speak to Israeli philanthropists, they know a lot about the issues that, they, that they're involved with. I meet them at the conferences that are issue-based. You go to a conference about poverty and you meet the philanthropists, not the professionals, by the way, because most of them do not hire professionals in Israel. Most of them just do the work themselves. They don't invest in the infrastructure. Again, there is no incentive to have a foundation. It costs overhead and money. They just channel all the money directly to who they want to support. And they're the ones doing the work. They're practically acting as executive directors and the philanthropists and the presidents. Or, so it's them doing multiple hat roles. 
And that's why we develop very deep content knowledge. What we call Mongo is a term that we've uh, framed in Israel, but it goes back to the point we just spoke about. It's my own NGO. So Israeli philanthropists often, when they identify the issue and they start their own NGO, to solve the issue. It has problems, but sometimes it's amazing. What we see down the road, five, six, seven years later often, is that they reach a point where they want to invest in other fields, but all their money is tied into this Mongo. It's very much in their image, because it's their baby. And it's very hard for them to find additional funders to step in so they can step out. Um, so there is a transitional problem there that they didn't think about when they started it years ago. Um, and also, when they start their own Mongo, often it dries out the entire ecosystem if there are other big players that operated in that field that were fundraising from here and there, and suddenly this one was parachuted down from the top with a lot of money because it had a big philanthropist backing it up. It changes the entire ecosystem and the other players, and it affects them. So there are pros and cons to this approach, but it's characteristic to Israeli philanthropy very much. Lack of infrastructure, as we just mentioned. Hands-on, high involvement, we just mentioned as well. Focused influence. So again, Israel is very small, as we spoke about before. And often people will decide in a good and strategic way to say, I'm focusing on a specific population, Ethiopian, Russian immigrants, um, kids in the periphery, um, you know, you name it, or in a specific geography. I'm only working in the negative. I'm only working in the Galilee. So you focus on a zone, it's much easier to reach impact. When you, when you define that area and the perimeters of it. And exit oriented. Is there a question? Exit oriented that a lot of them at one point, just like they did in their business or their high tech investment, they want to exit at one point. So often this leads to looking for collaborations with the government so they can exit and hand it over to the government and then the government scales it on a national level which often is a good dream for philanthropists and often happens, by the way. Or on the medium level, which is the local or regional level in Israel, you go to a city or to a municipality and they can scale it up. Again, it reaches much larger magnitude than a specific um, nonprofit or a specific uh, sector of the population. Can you give an example? I'm just of scaling? Yeah. Um, yeah, of course. So I can give you both an international example um, and a local example. So an international good example is the PJ Library. Okay, so when they started operating in Israel, before, they invested in the area of the Galilee, in the Gilboa, Afula, two areas, in, in numerous projects, not PG. It's uh, the Greenspan Foundation, but it was a PJ Library. They had different projects, so they had good relationships with locals, um, local municipalities, with local entities, nonprofits in that area, and they funded different things. When they decided to scale, take the PJ library model from the States and make Aliyah to Israel with a model, they looked around and said, how do we start? Let's start where we have relationships already, where we have connections. We know people in Afula and Gilboa. They know us. We have a trust relationship. Let's start there. So they turned to the, the municipality there. The municipality said, okay, let's bring in the Ministry of Education. They brought a liaison for the Ministry of Education because he can't enter the Israeli Ministry of Education with content without involving the headquarters, and they started on that local level. They ran a pilot for a year or two, it was very successful, and by the third year it expanded through that liaison for the Ministry of Environment that has the bird's eye view of the entire country to expand it to, all the, to many, many other municipalities. Um, that's an example of an overseas foundation based here with the ability, because it had connections and relationships, to really scale up a project there. Another example would be um, the Rashi Foundation. So Rashi Foundation, for example, has a cyber project that takes kids in the periphery, um, that all they need is a little computer, no matter where they're sitting, to be able to learn how to do cyber protection and cyber programming, um, and give them a jump start in being able to get into elite units in the army and then go into the high-tech sector and so on. So they started in the negative because they work in the periphery and they involved the government and it went so well, they scaled it up and were able to step out almost completely and the government put its funding in and it's running as a national project. So it's much easier if when you're stepping in, you know that that's the end result that you want to eventually reach, so you involve the right people from the beginning thinking of that exit day. It's much harder 
when you don't think of tomorrow and just run and do it and then try to. Now it's worth mentioning that we develop two handbooks that can be useful for people interested in this. One is the handbook on funder collaboration. And the second is the handbook on funder collaboration with the government of Israel, which brings case studies and examples of how it can be done, ideas of people to meet if you're interested in learning more about this. A project that was adapt, adopted by a city government includes the Slipka Foundation's investment in, um, in uh, universal Arabic classes for fifth and sixth graders in Haifa that succeeded well enough that the mayor of uh, Haifa uh, adopted it as a citywide venture. It's now being funded by the, gov by the, by the municipal government. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's another great example. And I think I don't know enough about how it works in the other parts of the world to this extent, but I think in Israel, people, there's openness. The municipality level is realizing more and more its ability to make impact and to scale up good projects that they see. We see it in Jerusalem, we see it in Tel Aviv, we see a lot of it in Beersheba now in Haifa. Um, and I think philanthropists also are realizing the potential, because it's easier than going to the national government to work on the municipal level. And often you have a, a soft spot, many philanthropists have a soft spot to a specific locality, whether they live there or had family there, or, and then it's, it makes a lot more sense for them to work in that area and feel connected to it and build lasting relationships. Also. Um, less political. Right, much less political and much more stable because of that. You're right, 100%. So just to conclude that part, there's a lot of potential and opportunities for international funders to collaborate with Israeli funders um, and to lean on their expertise and to network with each other and to share ideas. I mean, it's really, the, I think, that's the largest asset that JFN can offer is tapping into our network and offering referrals and people to learn from each other. Because when you work outside of JFN, they have no idea who else is funding what and what experience is out there and what mistakes have been made and they have no way of knowing it and thus avoiding mistakes or jumping forward based on its, on its success. And that's a big part of what we do on both sides of the ocean um, is putting people in touch once we identify what they're interested about and you should learn from each other and beautiful things come out of this meetings. Okay, so the second part is a bit of the practical point and then we'll open it to questions if you have on um, what I call long distance funding in Israel. So some key questions I think funders who work in Israel but are based outside of Israel should ask themselves at this point. Has anything changed in the way I'm funding in Israel over the past 10-15 years? If the answer is no, I would strongly encourage you to pause and think why not because Almost everything has changed in Israel in the past 10, 15 years to the extent that it needs, could these questions need to be asked to revisit whether or not the way that you do your philanthropy is the most effective way, whether there are other directions that could be addressed, whether there are other opportunities. And I think it's a key question to not just continue because that's what you're doing, but to stop and give it some thought. Do I know Israeli funders? We have 110 membership units in Israel. There are a lot of funders out there. Most of them are interested in the same issues that funders in the States are interested in. Even if you're not both funding in Israel, even if some fund disabilities here and some there, but you can share knowledge and information and models and inspiration. So if you don't know Israeli funders or only a few, come to us, we'll take care of that. I'm like, sure, you know Israeli funders. That's a great, great asset. Is there a connection or alignment between my Israel giving and my core strategy and fields of interest? I cannot tell you how many times I sit with funders from the States, especially from the States, that fund in Israel, and there's hardly any connection between what they do here and what they do there. Like two completely different portfolios. Here they're specialized in two fields, and they have deep content involvement, and they're professionals in the field, and they have good cutting edge strategies, and in Israel, it's a random portfolio that evolved because this and that, some sporadic sequence of events, there's no, and they never thought that they need to even stop and compare portfolios or think that they maybe should align them. It's like a completely different approach of how they do philanthropy here and how they do philanthropy there. And what I'm here is to say, if there isn't, but there is no good reason why there isn't, then you should stop and think whether you can align better. 
because that's where your passion is. If you're funding in these fields here, you can bring that passion to Israel. If you have expertise and knowledge, import them to Israel, share the knowledge. You have content base, you have a bigger added value than your dollars to bring to Israel and to the social sector in Israel. And we want to encourage that. What are my sources of information? If you're based here, but you fund in Israel, how do you make decisions? Where is the information coming from? Is it a trustworthy source? These are, I mean, we can also help with figuring out the best ways, but again, tapping into the JFN network, that's the biggest asset as a source of information because other funders have been where you are and are funding same issues and have experience and they can share firsthand what it was like working with this nonprofit or with that nonprofit. It's a very, very big value add. Give smart. What we view as strategic giving is giving that's based on values, but translated into a goal or a mission that is based either in a field or a place or a specific sector, as we mentioned before, that is based on knowledge as, as much as possible, that is impact oriented and hopefully measurable, although not to measure things to death and social change issues are hard to measure, but not to leave it completely vague. Collaborative, we are big believers in collaboration on every level between funders, between funders and municipalities, between funders and the government and so on. And significant size and length of commitment. I often work with funders, especially again in Israel, who have a portfolio of 50 grants and each grant varies between $1,000 and $5,000. Sometimes less is more, not always. Sometimes small micro grants are great, it depends what the goals are. But sometimes giving less grants but more significant ones for a longer period of time can make a much more impactful effect. And it's worth considering at least the alternative and not just giving in that way because that's how it used to be. Um, look deeper. Make sure you vet organizations. And when I say vetting, meet the organizations that you fund, learn about them, do the research, develop relationships, you can have a great mission statement. You can read this great material about a nonprofit. If you don't know the director, if you don't trust them, if you're not inspired by them, often the relationship won't work. And vice versa, they can have a not convincing mission statement and they can be a bit of a balagan, but the person is so convincing in their passion to what they do that you invest in people. Eventually, it's all about relationships, especially in philanthropy. So meet the people. If you can in person, visit, develop relationships. That trust direct, both way direction really creates fruitful things. I would I, I agree. I, I would add one other thing, which is investigate the governing structure of the organization. Is there a functioning board that the board member, how often does it meet? Is there someone who, uh, who, who does follow their finances? Is there someone who can be turned to for legal advice? Absolutely. So it, under the word vetting, there's a whole, I mean, we coach funders in vetting processes in Israel. You're absolutely right. There's a whole list of things that can be done to, to ensure that. And a large number of those 4,500 Amutot yeah. are not what we here would actually consider an Amutot because they are taking money from the government. They're taking something and they are hiring other little Amutot to do the to work. To do work, yeah. So that it's just a convincing person it's not yeah is not necessarily good enough <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe you need to you need to do yeah. the 360 Me off with convincing. <laughs> yeah that's true demand professionalism and i think you know I, sometimes i met funders who are like oh but it's so hard and you guys are doing such a good work and we just want to cut you some slack and you're not doing anyone a favor by you know, making shortcuts, because eventually you want the civil society in Israel to be impactful and strong and be able to promote its issues. And if you demand a high level of professionalism as a funder, you'll excel the entire field. You have that power as funders. It's very important to remember that. Not, again, not to drive crazy, but not, not to compromise, especially not on the important things. Seek local professional assistance if you need it. You don't necessarily need to hire full staff and everything, but it's, it often helps. And by the way, collaborations with Israeli funders often answer that need for international funders because they have staff or they themselves are based on the ground in Israel. They have the relationships. If you trust them, they do the oversight for you and you're collaborating with them. 
learn from the network, as we said before, and share. Consider capacity building. Everyone who comes from the nonprofit or is working and supporting nonprofits knows that we call it projectitis in Israel, that project oriented, that it's all funneled into pro projects. But sometimes the organization needs capacity building. It needs general support. Don't automatically rule it out because you don't like funding it. Sometimes if you want to better off an entire field, develop an infrastructure to promote a field, you need infrastructure for that field. So it's not a dirty word, general support or overhead. It depends again on the proportion of it. And also figure out what they need, the Amutun. Sometimes they do need training to work with volunteers because it's such a large extent of Israeli work or sometimes how to work with media and skip a grant on a focused project, but get the, the skills that they need to really make a difference. So consider field building as well and understand the ecosystem and the opportunities, preferably before you start working, but revisit that every few years to make sure because things are changing, changing very, very rapidly. So to conclude, what might this mean for you? Be as strategic as you can. Ask the questions we just spoke about. This is an era of opportunity. You, you can partner with Israeli funders and benefit from their experience and connections. They can be responsible for your investment. Um, a lot of time we see what we call the matching grants or one for one, you know. A lot of Israel, international funders are now saying, we'll give if you bring an Israeli funder. So people are looking for these leverage opportunities for dollar per dollar that brings more money into the pool. You can serve as philanthropic role models when you come from overseas and do philanthropy in Israel and collaborate with Israeli philanthropies. They, Israeli philanthropists are also very open to learn and hear from other approaches and from experience. And you offer a global look on issues and you can bring models and ideas into, uh, into Israel. And JFN can assist you in that. So we're really here to offer help in whatever we can. Um, it's important to know the JFN members, and we repeat this often, but I think people miss it sometimes. Every member is entitled for two hours of free um, advice a year um, from us in the Israel office. We offer it usually during the conferences um, when everyone comes together. But if funders come to Israel by themselves and would like a meeting or a Skype meeting or a phone meeting, we're here to offer that as well. Um, we do more in-depth philanthropic services and consultations on a one-on-one -on -one basis. We tailor make, we have, and you can go on our website and learn much more about the philanthropic services. We have many clients that we work with to develop philanthropic strategies as an objective professional entity that comes and understands what the funder needs and wants to achieve in Israel. And um, make sure you enjoy what you do. That's the most important part. That's it. So we can open for questions if there are any. Anyone on the phone have questions? May I add, it's a little bit off topic because it's not so much focused on JFN as, a, but another model that works is uh, hiring an Israeli staff person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we have done that in our foundation for kind of for most of its existence, 40 years now. And, the same uh, person for the 40 years? Sorry? The same person? No, two people. <laughs> um, uh, located, based in Israel? Yes, or? Okay, located in Israel, uh, part-time. And uh, who has, and, and there it's a matter of finding someone who is flexible enough to take direction from the states, if that's if that's where the uh, the foundation is located, someone who is connected enough to, and obviously you need someone with uh, either either perfect or near perfect Hebrew language skills. There's no point in getting a American lab who's who's still translating things. Um, someone who has uh, con connections and knows how to make further connections. It's not an easy you know. Role, but it, but it exists now. The benefit of that, aside from getting a lot of handholding, is that there is aside from the excellent work that JFN is as a forum for foundation in general, there is a parallel group called the um, the, the um, forum of the foundation. 
uh, Founders Forum, yeah. the Philanthropic Forum, uh, or um, Karen uh, um of representatives of overseas, mostly overseas foundations, of some Israeli families and foundations take part in it as well. And they meet on an irregular basis and are able to work on collaborations that way and information sharing that way. Very true. Very important in collaborating with Israeli Amadrettists to find out exactly how they actually operate. Mm -hmm. And um, they are transparency is not even a thought. Yeah. Uh, not financial transparency. Yeah. yeah. One development, uh, which is, we're still at the, at the beginning of it now, but is going to, I think, become much more important, is uh, programs in the Haredi sector. Uh, the Haredi, for a variety of reasons, the Haredi sector is, is waking up uh, in terms of its needs, and aside from its political muscle, it is working to develop uh, uh, its philanthropic capacity beyond the Gemach model. The Gemach being the, free, the um, good deed societies um, um, that uh, proliferate in the Haredi world. Um, and some of them are, have already made the transition to a more professional status. Some of them need a lot of help in that direction. But um, given that the Haredi world is changing uh, and, and the change will probably accelerate, that's my personal opinion, based upon the work that we've done. Um, it's uh, holding, you know, be, being aware of the weaknesses and being critical of the development of the leadership in Haredi-based or oriented organizations is worth uh, underlying, uh, underlining one more time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, we, I didn't mention this, but a lot of what we do in Israel is when we identify an issue that many funders are interested in because we have individual conversations or it surfaces in the conferences, we convene peer groups. Um, one of them is around the Haredi Society that's been on and off in different capacities for the past few years, and we've had a few programming events in Israel on Haredi population. And one here in uh, December And one here, right. The Accelerate Conference. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the funders are here. Yeah. Um, hi, Sigal. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Hannah Shaul Barnissim. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Brandeis University, and I study Jewish philanthropy and Israeli philanthropy. Uh, so thank you for your talk. This was very interesting. Um, and I do want to state that some of the data you presented, um, or some of the data in general, about philanthropy in Israel is actually outdated. It's uh, from 2010, 2012, there are efforts, uh, specifically here at Brandeis and in other places, to generate more up-to-date data um, about diaspora philanthropy to Israel, but also in addition about the flow of, um, we'll call it non-Jewish funders to Israel and their support of social services and welfare services in Israel. So I think we need to acknowledge these efforts in Israel as well. Um, I do also want to relate to the whole collaboration discussion you had about municipalities and the government. Um, I have a recent publication with Hegel Schmid on this issue of collaborations between local philanthropy and the government. And it's been quite a rocky road. Um, a lot of challenges and obstacles in the way. Um, we actually found that there has been less obstacles with international funders and more with local funders in Israel. But this is a very interesting aspect, especially when you want to create um, impact and carry out an effective program or initiative, uh, understanding how to manage a relationship with local government and national government in Israel is is key to success. Yeah, I, uh, thank you for that remark. First of all, you're right about the, out I mentioned it in my talk also, that it's very hard to obtain data and that we know that a lot of our data is outdated and that uh, Central Bureau of Statistics is now in the midst of uh, finalizing details on a new survey that's coming out. Do you know about it, Hannah? With Committed to Give? Yes. Yeah. 
So we're all waiting for this. Yes, it's the new version, right? 20, yeah. 2013, 2015. Exactly. So I would mention that I just started a collaboration with Tel Aviv University to track the flow of funds to Israel. So yeah. we should have data in a couple of months as well. Is that and we're working on broader projects. With Galia, right? Sorry? With Galia. Yes, with yeah. the Institute on Law and Philanthropy. It's our Brandeis Tel Aviv University collaboration. Yeah. So a couple of months, yeah. I hope to have some data. Yeah, absolutely. No, we know it's... Uh, you know, uh, the, the recent report, for example, was issued here in 2012 by Flash and Sasson, which only explored pass-through and friends of organization, mm -hmm. which is quite a substantial amount. It's about $2.2 .2 billion, but it's not everything. Right. Um, and under, understanding a more in-depth um, insights about not just, you know, how much money is goes to Israel, but who are the funders today, and what's the changing balance between private funders, community foundations, donor advice funds, federations, and also the field of support in Israel. The, the um, distribution that you presented between social services and religion, it is true, but even within these fields, we're seeing different types of grants and different types of strategies of support, as you probably know. So... I mean, I mean, your presentation, I think it's, it's wonderful that you're raising awareness to this issue of Israeli philanthropy, but it also emphasizes that we need, we need much more knowledge in the field, both of practitioners and of scholarly research. Um, so, yeah, thanks. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? I'm just uh, following up on that point. I'm, I wonder, is, are there... Is there more current information about the degree of foreign government or foreign uh, multilateral government uh, uh, philanthropic giving in Israel from the USAID, from the European, uh, the various European centers in particular? Hannah, you do you know? Yes, we know that US foreign aid has yeah. been. Um, increasing uh, consistently in the past uh, 45 years. Um, but we do know that actually support from federal foundations and government-based organizations in Europe has been um, under much more, um, let's, let's just say uh, in Israel laws have been demanding much more transparency in that sense of government funding from European um, um, funders as well as, as U.S. federal funders, um, really trying to understand who funds what in Israel. Um, overall, um, federal funding from Europe has been dedicated more to advocacy, human rights, um, peacekeeping, and issues, well, not peacekeeping, peace promotion, and issues of this sort, but it has not been significant in that sense. It has always been the smaller or less, uh, not such a high profile in the overall uh, fields of uh, philanthropic support in the past uh, decade. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Do okay. we have any conclusion there? I'm just wondering if there's anyone who has typed anything. Oh. Now we need to check that. Oh, yeah, you're something. right. At the top, sorry. Should I stop the screen? No. no. <laughs> that was me first. You can ignore it. <laughs> the first two lines are from me. Where do I even click to find them? There you go. Oh, uh, chat. chat. Oh. Sorry, I forgot about it. Uh, the number of Israeli nonprofits, the source. Well, that was, that was me um, before I could fix my mic, so you can ignore my comments, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but I guess the question, I guess the first question. <laughs> yeah. I so the, the second, what are good? What are good resources to do research on Israeli nonprofits? Where to look up financial info, for example? Okay, um, it's a good question. We have GuideStar in Israel as well. Um, it's considered uh, uh, not a, let's say, not a, a holistic tool that gives the entire um, picture. Um, but you should ask from the nonprofits to receive their audited reports to make sure that these are um, formal reports that have been approved um, to learn how to read uh, and analyze the financial reports um, and then to see, you know, how, how balanced they are, where the other sources of income are coming from, how many are secured, how many are pending, 
Um, a lot of it needs to be based on what the, the nonprofit feeds you, but if you have the ability to read it through the right eyes and also consult with other funders who have funded them in the past, look at the boards, see, like you mentioned before, see who else supervises the nonprofit, who sits there, who's um, reliable for some of their work, that gives the other elements of the 360 analysis of making sure there's uh, um, sustainability to that specific organization. I'm not sure I know all the rules involved, the 46A, the Malkari, um, the <coughs> tax deductible organizations, would, or the grants that are tax deductible, do they have to report the sources uh, of their of their grants of, of their income. Yeah, they do. And every you, every nonprofit. Non non okay, but anonymous is what is. Yeah, is you not, can I you see. can ask to to remain anonymous on their lists. Um, there is a level to that from a specific level of uh, I forget if it's two hundred thousand. There is a figure. There are limitations to the anonymous status that you so you can't give a huge huge grant to remain anonymous, but. There are, so there are limitations within it. I don't want to make a mistake here because I need to double check it. So I don't want to give you the exact figure, but it's a process you need to go through to avoid having your name appear. Otherwise, every nonprofit needs to report all of the sources of income. Or, have, or having the nonprofit divulge where they're getting them. Yeah. So does uh, MISUIT, does the, the tax authorities uh, compile that information in any way? Yeah, but it's hard to reach, and uh, it's not accumulated in a in a in easy to use fashion. There, we're still um, light years behind in the way these mechanisms are operating in a way that gives transparency and are useful to funders to use um, to make decisions based on them. So it's we rely on other bypassing alternatives to be able to give a better picture, which isn't the best way, but it's what we've got right now. What about um, Midot? Yeah. So I know it's controversial, but do you think it's a good way? Yeah, I think so. Midot, it's a nonprofit that does, um, it has a, um, a status that it gives. They have two levels of it. You can, as a nonprofit, go through the easy one that you do independently that doesn't cost you much. Um, and if you pass it, they validate it, and you, it gives like a set of criteria of certain um, uh, professional management and uh, good operations and so on. If you go through their entire um, session of uh, them screening you and analyzing you, it's an analysis and you get the um, vote of confidence, or I'm not sure what the right term in English would be. Kushpanka, yes, a tav tekin kase. That means they've really screened you through a set of many, many criteria, which many of them are very relevant. Um, so if you're a funder and they have the validation from IDOT, that's a good sign, but the lack of the validation from IDOT is not necessarily a bad sign because it is very timely for a nonprofit to go through this and it costs money. And not all nonprofits have the time, ability, it's not on their agenda, so many for various reasons don't do this. They, they might have easily passed, but they've never went through the process, so not to give a grant because they don't have it is not what I would recommend, but if they do have it, it's a good sign. So on, uh, on that sign. Uh, and um, um, the organizations, I think, are slowly, especially the larger ones, are becoming better in, in bringing across the message of what they're about and how they're operating and putting themselves in a transparent place because they know that funders overseas are seeking this information. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. And visit. And visit. 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 Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much.